right, today we're going to be talking about Ultra Ultrasound. My name is Roshna Subramoni. I work at UCSD in the Department of Emergency Medicine as part of the Ultrasound Division. So let's get started. We're going to be talking about the indications for performing an ocular ultrasound. And this would include patients with acute or subacute vision loss, any ocular trauma, to assess for the presence of a foreign body, and to evaluate for patients with increased ICP. So let's go over the key anatomical structures to be aware of when performing an ocular ultrasound. So these include the shape and contour of the cornea and sclera, which is going to be seen on the left side of your screen, making sure that the lens is in the proper location, which is between the anterior and posterior chamber, making sure that the retina follows the same contour as the sclera and you're not seeing signs of a retinal detachment or signs of a hyperechoic density within the posterior chamber that could be that retina peeling away from the sclera. And also, we want to make sure that the optic nerve is the correct diameter, so to look for any thickness, increasing thickness of the optic nerve. Here's another image, which is more useful, as it's in the same orientation as what you'll see on your screen when you're performing an ocular ultrasound. So in this case, again, we're going to look at the cornea, the sclera, the lens, the optic nerve, and then the retina itself. So let's discuss proper technique in performing this scan. We're going to use a low frequency linear transducer because the eye is a very superficial structure. You can use a tegaderm if you wish. You don't have to, but if you are going to use a tegaderm, you want to make sure that there's no trapped air bubbles underneath so that they're not going to impair your ability to scan. Use lots and lots of gel and make sure you stabilize that linear transducer with one to two fingers, so either your pinky or your ring finger, so if the patient moves their head, you minimize the chance of an injury and also the transducer moves along with their head. And be very cognizant to not put any extra pressure on the eye, especially in cases of trauma. We always want to set the proper gain, especially because the eye is an anechoic fluid-filled structure, so you are going to get posterior acoustic enhancement just beneath the eye, and it can impair your ability to look at the optic nerve. And in some cases, you may actually want to turn up your gain because that posterior chamber, if it's completely anechoic, it may be difficult to see a retinal detachment or a vitreous hemorrhage. And also, lastly, remember to scan in two planes and have the patient move their eye during exam that's actually extremely important because we want to make sure that if there's a small retinal detachment that we don't miss it because the patient isn't moving their eye. So now let's see what that looks like on ultrasound. This is an image of a normal eye and as you can see the cornea is at the top of your screen closest to your transducer you're seeing the lens below that and then the posterior chamber or the vitreous. We want to see that optic nerve just posterior to that posterior chamber. We'll also go over the ocular pathology now. So the reason we talked about the indications is because these are the main reasons that we would use an ocular ultrasound. So we're going to look for vision changes. We're going to look for traumatic loss of vision. We will also look for painless loss of vision. And then lastly, an indication would be to evaluate for increased intracranial pressure. So if you look here, your lens dislocation, you're looking at the lens which is between the anterior and the posterior chamber, and that will be completely shifted and found in the posterior chamber. This is not a subtle finding on ultrasound, and we'll go over what that looks like. You can also use it to assess for an intraocular foreign body, and based on the type of foreign body we're looking at, we'll see different artifacts. So if you have a metal foreign body, you may see some rain down or reverberation artifact that can help you locate that foreign body. We'll also quickly look for retrobulbar hematoma, and we'll show you what a globe rupture looks like on ultrasound, where you lose that contour of the posterior chamber completely. We'll also discuss a retinal detachment and how to distinguish that from a vitreous hemorrhage or a vitreous detachment. And then also, when we look at painless loss of vision, you can also once again see a retinal detachment, the vitreous detachments that we talked about, 
A more advanced feature is to also look for essential retinal artery occlusion. And then lastly, if you want to evaluate for increased intracranial pressure, you can do so by measuring the optic nerve sheath diameter. And that's done by measuring three millimeters posterior to the globe itself. And then any assessment less than five millimeters or so is considered normal. And a diameter greater than five millimeters would be a sign of increased intracranial pressure. So like we talked about, one of the first set of indications is to evaluate for trauma and use ultrasound to evaluate for the complications of ocular trauma. So lens dislocation, you'll see that bright oval object, and instead of being where it should be between the anterior and posterior chamber, that lens is now found in the posterior chamber. We'll also look for foreign body like we talked about, and then the other findings such as a retroorbital hematoma or globe rupture or hyphema, which can be seen with trauma as well. So the lens dislocation, like we mentioned, this is not a subtle finding. If you look here, instead of the lens being all the way at the top between the anterior and the posterior chamber, you're seeing it down here in the posterior chamber, surrounded by hemorrhage, you're losing that anechoic nature of the normal posterior chamber, and instead you have all these different echoes within it, um, and much more hyperechoic than you, what you would normally find in a completely normal posterior chamber. Also, like we talked about for intraocular foreign bodies, sometimes you may not see this foreign body, you may just see the artifact that's posterior to it. So in cases of things like metal, you may see reverberation, you may see some ring down artifact, you may see some shadowing based on the foreign body that you're able to localize. A retrobulbar hematoma can also be seen and that's sometimes around the eye. And then also for your globe rupture, you lose that contour completely of the posterior chamber. It just looks like everything has been completely squished in the eye itself. And hyphema is different from the stuff that we were looking at prior to this because you're really focusing on that anterior chamber and it's a very small space. And this can often be found on your physical exam as well. And so not as useful with ultrasound, but it's still a finding that we can see. And so if you're looking at that anterior chamber, you will see hyperechoic densities on the sides, which is indicative of a hyphema. So now let's go over the other indication, which we, would be to evaluate for painless loss of vision. We have many patients that come in for this, and I think this is really the key for ocular ultrasound because many of these findings we cannot just distinguish based on our physical exam, like we can for some of the traumatic indications. So a retinal detachment versus a posterior vitreous detachment or vitreous hemorrhage is very difficult to tell based on physical exam alone and can really make a difference in patient management. Cases of retinal detachment, you may want the ophthalmologist to intervene in the next 12 to 24 hours, and they need to come in right away. So it is important to be able to do this scan and be able to tell your ophthalmologist what you found on your B scan to help you distinguish between a retinal or a vitreous detachment. And then also you can use this and use ultrasound as a feature to help you diagnose central retinal, retinal artery occlusion. Obviously, that's a much more advanced feature of ocular ultrasound, but we will go over it quickly. So first, let's talk about retinal detachments. So the key here is you're looking at the pupil, the lens, which we said would be right in this area, and you see your cornea here. If you make a perpendicular line from your pupil and cornea all the way down, you'll be able to see where your optic nerve should be, and your retina should attach to that location. If it crosses the midline or crosses the optic nerve, it's more likely to be a vitreous detachment, and that's what helps distinguish it between a retinal and a vitreous detachment. Normally, the retina should be anchored right here to the posterior chamber, but instead of that into the sclera, we are seeing it separating from the sclera, and that's that hyperechoic white line that you're seeing in that posterior chamber or the vitreous. Next thing we would look for is a vitreous detachment. And you can clearly tell that this looks quite different and there's a bunch of echoes within that posterior chamber. So normal posterior chamber should be completely anechoic, but in this case, you're seeing multiple different echoes, which is consistent with a vitreous detachment or a vitreous hemorrhage. We can view a video of it here. Many people call this a washing machine sign because as you can tell, it looks like there's something swirling within that posterior chamber. This is another example of it right here. And it looks like clothes swirling inside a washing machine. 
Next thing we can look at is a central retinal artery occlusion for painless loss of vision. So with this, you're looking at a hyperechoic signal in the distal central retinal artery. And this can sometimes be seen because if you look at in here, you see this hyperechoic signal near the area of where the optic nerve would be. And then if you put color flow in this area, so if you use either your color or even your spectral Doppler, you'll be able to see that there's minimal flow and you're not getting those same peaks that you should be getting in a normal eye. So one thing you can do is you can look at the contralateral eye to compare it to the normal, where you'll be seeing these amplitudes at these peaks, which you don't see in an area of central retinal artery occlusion because there is decreased flow to that area. And then of course you can use your fundoscopic exam to help make that diagnosis as well. So now the last indication that we often use ultrasound for is to evaluate for increased intracranial pressure. And this can be used as a surrogate for papilledema. Ultrasound has been found to have a pretty high sensitivity and specificity for this diagnosis, greater than 92-95%. Um, the key, though, is to make sure you are, in fact, measuring the optic nerve and not just measuring a shadow, which can be tricky. So we'll quickly go over that. And the it's important to remember that you want to measure three millimeters posterior to the globe every time. And like we mentioned earlier, normal is less than five millimeters. Anything larger than that is a sign of increased intracranial pressure. So if we look here, this is the posterior part of our globe. We are measuring three millimeters below that. And if you look from B to B, the diameter that's measured in here, you'll see that the measurement is 0.87 centimeters, which is larger than 0.5, which is indicative of an increased intracranial pressure. But if you look at image B, you'll see that, again, three millimeters posterior to the globe, when you measure that, you're getting 0.45, which is less than 0.5, and that is an example of a normal width of an optic nerve, and that's not indicative of a dilated optic nerve or increased intracranial pressure. And so those are our main indications for using ocular ultrasound in the emergency department. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to email us, contact us, and we'll get back to you. I hope you enjoyed listening to this lecture and that you learned something. Bye now.